Hi, everyone. D.A. Carson has contributed a chapter in, in this book. Uh, oh, how do I do it? There. Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. His chapter is based on the scripture 1 Corinthians 14 verses 33b to 36, which is the text includes the statement, women should remain silent in the churches. So we talked a little bit about it in the previous video. Under uh, the subtitle, Unsatisfying Interpretations, Carson is addressing how some have tried to deal with the text of 1 Corinthians 11, 2 to 16 about women praying and prophesying with head coverings. What do we do with Corinthians, including both these statements? So here he's um, giving their argument and then he responds to it. Some continue to see the demand for silence as an absolute rule. Several seek to escape the tension between chapter 11 verses 2 to 16 and this one 14 33b to 36 by arguing that only the latter passage has reference to public assembly the former deals only with the home or with a small group gathering <coughs> excuse me in that case Nothing in 1 Corinthians prevents the interpreters taking the pro pro prohibition of chapter 14 absolutely, so far as church assembly is concerned. This interpretation does not seem very likely for a. Paul thinks of prophecy primarily as revelation from God, delivered through believers in the context of the church where the prophecy may be evaluated chapter 14 verses 23 to 29 b distinctions between smaller house churches and church may not have been all that intelligible to the first uh, first christians who commonly met in private homes c the language of 1116, and then he has the quote, if anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God, seems to suggest a church concern, not merely the concern of private or small group piety. All right, let's see. I Okay, and D... He fills it in more than I'm giving you. I'm just giving you the thrust of it. D, the immediately succeeding verses, 11, 17 to 34, are certainly devoted to an ordinance designed for the assembly. And E, I some, if someone points out that 11, 2 to 16, unlike 14, verses 33 to 36, does not include the phrase in the church, it must also be observed that 11, 2 to 16 does not restrict the venue to the private home or small group. Okay, and then he has a few more, a couple more points, I think. Then he says under F, if the restriction pertains to every venue except the church assembly, does this mean that the Christian wife must postpone her private prayer until she has hurried to her chambers and donned her headpiece? The restriction is coherent only in a public setting. G. Above all, the universality of the promise of Joel cited at Pentecost that the Holy Spirit would be poured out on men and women such that both would prophesy as constitute, uh, okay, I can't say this word, constitute, no, constit, okay, I'm going to just leave that word out because <laughs> I can't say it right now. 
prophecy as members of the community of the new covenant seems somehow less than transparent if the woman may display their inheritance only outside the gathered messianic community all very good points which would weaken the the argument that was presented that it's just uh, small groups instead of church okay uh, then he talks about another concern here he says interpretations attempt to resolve the difficulty by ascribing verses 34 to 35 as some part of them or some part of them to the position of the Corinthians perhaps even to a quote from their letter so the some are saying well this part is really him quoting the letter they sent to him their letter the Corinthians to Paul okay then he goes uh, there are many variations of this, of this, but the central purpose of these approaches is to assign the parts that do not seem to cohere with Paul's thoughts as, enumer uh, as enunciated elsewhere to the Corinthian position Paul is setting out to refute. If the law, verse 34, means the Old Testament one must find some place where the woman where women are told to be silent and we are told there isn't one therefore law must refer to something else one common view is that it represents torah which in the first instance means teaching but was commonly used to cover both scripture and associated Jewish traditions. So the law here refers to Jewish tradition that the Corinthians have unwisely adopted. Verse 34 to 35 summarize that position. Paul's horrified response is given in verse 36 and the fact that the word only is masculine may suggest that Paul is saying in effect did the word of God originate with you men only? Moreover, it has been argued that the first word of verse 36 must not be taken here as a comparative particle or, but as a, dis a disjunctive particle expressing shock and overturning what immediately proceeds. What? Did the word of God originate with you men only? Again, however, the arguments are not as convincing as they first seem. We may conveniently divide a response into parts. So I'm just going to go to one particular statement that he makes. It is very doubtful that verses 34 to 35 constitute a quotation, perhaps from the Corinthian letter. During the last decade and a half, one notable trend in Corinthian studies has been to postulate that Paul is quoting the Corinthians in more and more places, usually in places where the commentator does not like what Paul is saying. That Paul does, does quote from the Corinthians letter is, is a letter no one disputes, but the instances that are almost universally recognized as quotations. Then he gives you the example 612, 71b, and 81b enjoy certain common characteristics. First one being they are short. Uh, and then the example everything is permissible for me. 612. Two, they are usually followed by sustained qualification. So in 6.12, Paul goes on to add, but not everything is beneficial, but I will not be mastered by anything. And then following one more brief quotation from their letter, he devotes several verses to the principle he is expounding. 
three, Paul responds in unambiguous, even, even sharp, his responses. The first two criteria utterly fail if we assume verses 34 to 35 are a quotation from a letter sent by the Corinthians. So in, in this series, I've only been giving you samples of the different uh, authors that contribute. This is uh, because it's a huge book. We couldn't read the whole thing. And also because I just want to give you a, a sampling of their style and their way of, of teaching. So I hope if you want a fuller, uh, a fuller uh, take on his uh, argumentation that you will get the book, which I would recommend to anyone concerned about this issue or trying to figure it out. For us ex-Jehovah's Witnesses who were told what was uh, the right teaching about virtually everything in the organization, they would tell you, and uh, this, this um, idea that people within the church might have differing takes on things, differing ways of presenting it. Their books don't all sound the same. They don't use the same kind of argumentation. This is very foreign to us ex-witnesses when we first leave, and maybe even a little disturbing, and we might find it somewhat confusing. Uh, but this is only because we were, we were told what to believe. We were just given one argument from the organization and nobody else. So what do we do? Uh, it was so simple to have someone else give us the position so that no wrestling was required of us and no decision had to be made by us. Somebody else did it all. So we may be tempted to just take the position that we feel most comfortable with or that we like, but did we wrestle? That should be the question we ask. Did we look at the positions given and see the strengths and weaknesses in the positions so that we had to wrestle with it? Uh, try to understand both positions and see that. See their weaknesses and their strengths and then make your decision. But really try and understand. Don't have an, an argument already settled in your own mind and, and not be looking at why people take it differently. This is all new to us uh, ex-witnesses. I'm going to uh, link to a video that is called What JW Org is Not Telling You about Christian unity, and a second one by Ray Franz. So his is, is called, unlike JW's, Paul assumes disagreements in the body. Thank you for listening.